Let's take a closer look now at real business cycle theory. And the best way to approach this is just kind of think about the um, a very simplified view of classical economics and how they viewed the world. I put a little I put an asterisk here because this is a simplification and it's a little unfair, but I think it'll be helpful in our approach to real business cycle theory. Okay, the core assumptions of classical economics, at least in this simplified, characterized view, are basically two things. Prices are flexible. Prices for all resources, prices for both inputs, land, labor, and capital, and outputs, consumer goods, and commodities are flexible, meaning what? Prices adjust quickly to maintain equilibrium in any particular market for any particular good, anywhere, anytime in the economy. And what this means is that market's always clear. Okay? We would never expect to see persistent surpluses or shortages in any good, whether we're talking, again, input markets, land, labor, capital, or output markets, consumer goods. Therefore, what? Well, this indicates if, if markets work really well, we could never have what they refer to as a general glut of goods, okay? overproduction of goods, which would result in a surplus, which was, would result in a decrease in production in any industry or in the economy in general. Okay? If you had too many goods in the economy in general, well, how could we have too many goods? Okay? Scarcity. Wants are unlimited, but means are scarce. Classical economics says we can never have too many goods in general, which would lead to a decline in production and widespread unemployment. Okay? Now, we could have too many of one kind of good relative to another, but we'll find out really soon. What will happen is we, let's say we have too many cars and not enough houses. The price of cars is going to go down. The profit rate on producing cars is going to go down. Entrepreneurs are going to quickly get wind of this and capitalists and they're going to shift capital investment away from cars and into houses. Okay? And when they shift capital investment, that'll shift employment as well. So we should never have a long-term decline in production across the economy in the kind of what I'll call the naive classical view. Right. As I mentioned here, unemployed resources should swiftly find employment somewhere in the economy. The prices will adjust, okay? the prices, price mechanism will kick in, it will reorient the resources. Therefore, we should never see widespread unemployment. And remember back from my, my preview, I said the big problem of business cycles is the unemployment problem. Not so much the GDP problem for our modern developed economies, but the unemployment problem. Well, classical econ world widespread unemployment, especially of labor, is almost ruled out just from the general assumptions of the model. We can't think through the implications of this and we'll come up with an explanation that will make sense in the classical framework. To get a sense of this, we'll take a look at a passage from John Baptiste Say's book here, his treatise on political economy, which came out in the early 1800s. Say says, quote, but it may be asked, if this be so, how does it happen that there is at times so great a glut of commodities in the market and so much difficulty in finding an event for them? In other words, he's saying, okay, sometimes we do see a glut of commodities, which means a sur surplus across the economy, and that would entail unemployment, because if businesses build up a surplus, that means they don't, they, no longer, they don't need to keep on producing the good, so they ratchet down their use of inputs, land, labor, and capital. So much difficulty in finding a vent. Why is it hard for businesses to sell their goods? Okay, that's also what's happening in a recession. Continuing, why cannot one of these superabundant commodities be exchanged for another? I answer that the glut of a particular commodity arises from its having outrun the total demand for it in one or two ways, either because it has been produced in excessive abundance or because the production of other commodities has fallen short. So notice he's still in a very classical framework here. There's only one good at a time can be in overabundance, and if that's the case, the price of that good will fall. And if other goods are less abundant, their prices should rise, and we should redirect production to those um, 
more scarce articles. We should never see widespread unemployment. But let's see what Say is going to, how Say is going to tackle this, continuing on. He says, it is because the production of some commodities has declined that other commodities are super abundant. To use a more hackneyed phrase, people have bought less because they have made less profit. And they have made less profit for one or two causes. Either they have found difficulties in the employment of their productive means, or these means have themselves become deficient. I'm highlighting this last part of the passage here. Let's focus in on this, because this is kind of the, the crux of real business cycle thinking. Okay, he says, why is, there, why is the productive capacity of the economy reduced? Okay. Why is business activity down? Why is it hard for businesses to sell their output, and therefore they reduce their demand for inputs, particularly labor, which is unemployment, right? Again, he says, businesses have found difficulties in the employment of their productive means, or the means have themselves been deficient. What does that mean? These means have themselves been deficient. Well, it means something is going wrong with the land, labor, and capital in the economy. And if we destroy or lose or somehow impair our land, labor, and capital, we're obviously not going to be able to produce as much output. We're going to see a decline in GDP. Okay. So let's focus on this phrase from Say's book. He says the means of production have become deficient. And let's try to spell out exactly the ways in which that can happen. Okay. What we're basically saying is the economy has lost some factors of production, and therefore GDP is going to go down. On the other hand, we could explain a boom with this as well. If the economy suddenly gained factors of production, we'd see a sudden rise in GDP. Okay. And what we call these are, are shocks, real shocks to the economy. We also might call them productivity shocks, and we also might call them supply shocks. I know that's a lot of labels. Uh, it'll become a little more evident here when I spell out the um, how we work with this graphically. But basically, again, what we're looking at is when we have big changes in factors of production, and the sudden means it could actually occur over, it could occur within a period of days, it could occur over a period of years as well, and large, it has to affect across the economy, not just one little corner of the economy. If it causes noticeable changes in our real GDP growth rate, Okay, that qualifies as a real shock. Okay. And here's really all you need to know about what's causing business cycles in real business cycle theory. A positive real shock, an increase in factors of production, causes a boom. A negative real shock, a decrease in factors of production, causes a recession. It is very straightforward theory. Okay. Now, let's work with this in what we call the ASAD, or to be precise, the Aggregate Supply and Demand Framework. And what I'm going to do is um, graph, we're going to graph output, okay, and what we've got on the horizontal is real GDP, real gross domestic product. Think of it as output or production. And up here on the vertical, we have the price level, the level of prices in the entire economy. This will look a little bit like a normal supply and demand graph that we're familiar with from micro, but it's not. Okay, it's, it's for the whole economy, so we're not dealing with the price of one good, but we're dealing with the price level across the entire economy. We're not dealing with quantity of one good, we're dealing with the overall level of output for the entire economy. The main thing we're going to be interested in with real business cycle theory is what's known as the aggregate supply curve pretend that's a uh, straight line. Okay, I'm just going to call this aggregate supply. What aggregate supply is, is basically just the capacity of the economy to produce goods. What is that based on? Well, that's based on the real factors of production. Land, labor, capital. And I'll throw technology in here as well so we can also later on put this in terms of a solo model. Okay. We've got so much land so many workers, so many tools and equipment for those workers to use, and it's a given level of technology, and that determines how much output we can produce. Let's just to put numbers on here, let's just say a thousand units of real output. That's how much we can produce. Notice it's a vertical line. It doesn't change with respect to the price level, okay? Whether 
the purchasing power of money is high or low, whether the price level is high, which of course means the purchasing power of money is low, or whether the price level is low, which means the purchasing power of money is high, that doesn't matter. That doesn't change the amount of land, labor, capital, and the level of technology available to us at a given time in the economy. And notice this sum. Um, what we're working with right now is technically called the static aggregate supply and aggregate demand framework. We're looking at a point in time. Okay. More on that later. Okay. What happens in real business cycle theory is that we see an increase in our real factors, such that let's say the economy in the next time period, maybe it's one year later, can now produce 1,200 goods, 1,200 units of real output what happened? We had some kind of positive shock. We'll call this a positive real shock to our factors of production. We have more land and or labor and or capital and or better technology level and hence this economy can produce quite a bit more goods. Now it's not just quite a bit more goods but it's more goods than we had maybe anticipated. Maybe on the old growth trend we had anticipated let's say a 5% growth rate. So let's say we had anticipated that the economy could go up to 1,050, that would be 5%, right? But instead we went up to 1,200, which is a 20% growth rate, okay? 20%, maybe our trend was 5%, and we actually achieved 20%, but we're well above trend, that's a boom. Okay, that's a, the upswing in the business cycle. That's okay. That's a boom phase of a business cycle. What the heck is going on? In real business cycle theory, we're going to have to look to some sudden massive increase in one or these one of these factors or several of these factors. And I'll give you some concrete examples. And again, how could those factors increase in the real world that much that fast? Well, we have examples. We do have uh, examples where real business cycle theory can indeed explain uh, booming economic growth. Okay. We also have examples, and let's turn this around now. We have examples where real business cycle theory can explain a sudden and large drop-off in production. Let's say we go down to 900. That's a minus 10%. And that's a recession, at least in GDP terms. Now, we haven't dealt with unemployment yet, but we've got, if we have a minus 10% growth, that's a pretty big drop off. It's well below the trend, which remember I said let's was five percent. And what's going on here? Well, we're going to look at we're going to look for a negative real shock. We lost one or more of these factors of production. So something bad happened to our land. Something bad happened to our workers. Start thinking about what possibly could happen. What bad things could happen to our land, labor, our capital, or our technology level that makes our economy le less capable of producing goods. Right? And that's going to explain the recession. That's re what real business cycle is all about. And really, the only thing you have to remember graphically is this simple picture right here. I know it's a little cluttered. Here, let me, let's clean up and start over. We have an initial aggregate supply curve. I'll label it aggregate supply zero. And remember, that stands for the capacity of the economy based on the currently available real factors of production, land, labor, capital, technology. To explain a boom, we're looking for positive real shocks, that's a plus sign, okay, positive real shocks, which push us up here to aggregate supply one, and notice it's at a higher level of real output, okay, that's a growth in output, I'll put some numbers on here just to make it concrete, let's go from 1,000 to 1,200, and to explain the decline, we're looking for negative real shocks, which is doing the opposite, which is somehow reducing, destroying, ruining some of our factors of production. And that takes us, say, to AS2. And again, let's say that's a level of 900. Okay, that's our recession. This is all you need to know as far as the graph is concerned. Now, you might be thinking, well, that you said aggregate supply, aggregate demand. That's what the AS, AED stands for. Where the heck is aggregate demand? I'll show you, not because it matters in real business cycle theory. The only thing that matters in real business cycle theory is aggregate supply. And in fact, let me write this down. RBC is what we would call a supply side theory. 
this is important because when we start talking about the Keynesian theory, that's going to be a demand side theory. Okay, real business cycle theory, supply side theory. Just something to keep in mind. It's very helpful to understand different business cycle theories in terms of the others, in terms of how they are uh, similar and different from the others. What about aggregate demand? Well, it doesn't matter in terms of causing a business cycle, but I'll, let me just give you a brief explanation of how aggregate demand works because we will start thinking about aggregate demand when we look into the Keynesian theory. So let me go ahead and draw the aggregate demand curve in here. Aggregate demand curve is shaped like a demand curve for any particular good. But it's not based on the marginal value concept. Here it's just based on a kind of empirical relationship. It is a logical and empirical relationship between the price level and real output at a given level of nominal spending. And that's the main thing you need to understand about the aggregate demand curves. What this really means is a given given level, a given amount of total nominal spending. And what does nominal mean as opposed to real? Nominal just means the raw dollar amount. Uh, real, as you hopefully remember from our past unit, means adjusting for inflation. Okay. A given level of total nominal spending. Why does it slope down? Well, think about it. It's logical. Okay, Up here, the price level is high meaning prices of goods are high and I want to again put the PPM over here. Remember the PPM is the inverse of the price level. When the price level is high, that means the PPM is what? Low. Okay. Every dollar has a low purchasing power. Dollar prices of goods are high. What does that mean? A given level of nominal spending, is that going to buy you a lot of goods or not so many goods? Goods prices are high in terms of dollars. The, per, the value of every dollar is low. A given amount of spending, and let's, you know, again, I'll be concrete and put a number on this. Let's say we're talking about $1,000 worth of spending every year. Okay. $1,000 worth of spending, and let's think about real output in very concrete terms as well. You know, let's, I'll say sandwiches because I'm hungry right now. Okay. And I might have spelled that wrong, but bear with me. Okay. If the purchasing power of money is low, the price level is high, let's say sandwiches cost $10 each. $10 for a sandwich. You're only buying 100. That's not too many, right? Think about a point on the aggregate demand curve. And again, we're still spending that same $1,000. Still spending that same $1,000 down here on the aggregate demand curve we're at a point where the price level is now low meaning what in terms of purchasing power if prices for all goods are low a given dollar will buy you a lot more stuff the purchasing power of money is high okay and let's say sandwiches now cost one dollar lower price level higher value of a given dollar. One dollar buys you a sandwich here. Here one dollar only bought you one tenth of a sandwich. That was a weak dollar. That was a low PPM. Now we're dealing with a high PPM. Okay, so a low purchasing power over to the same aggregate demand curve, which means the same level of total spending. And now what are we going to get? We're going to get a hundred, we're going to get a thousand sandwiches. We're going to be able to buy a thousand sandwiches for that same amount of, that same given level, that same one thousand dollars worth of spending. Okay. So this is what the aggregate demand curve is. It's just superimposing the level of total dollar spending, total nominal spending, onto the framework. Again, it doesn't matter. And what I'll do now is put the aggregate supply curve back in here. Ah, again, that's supposed to be a straight line. Bear with me. Okay, aggregate supply zero. And let's just say we don't have any. Let's I'll put a number on that. One thousand again thousand units of just generic output and this time we won't work with shocks but I'll just we'll think about the effect of we won't work with real shocks we'll think about the effect of different levels of aggregate demand okay. so let's have an aggregate demand curve and we'll label this AD zero and again let's say it's one thousand dollars it's a level of total nominal spending let's say it's just one thousand dollars spent in this time period okay. the price 
of 1,000 units of output if we're spending $1,000 is one, right? Why does aggregate demand not matter in the in the classical framework or real business cycle framework? Well, think about it this in very simple terms. Let's just in, let's expand, let's increase aggregate demand, which means we're going to shift the aggregate demand curve out and to the right. We'll call this aggregate demand one. And to be concrete again, I'll say we expand this up to hundred thousand dollars. That's a massive increase. I'm doing a really large increase just to make things really obvious. Do we have more land labor capital in the economy or a higher technology level just because we're spending more nominal dollar units? The answer is no. So what happens to output? It doesn't change. Output is still fixed by the aggregate supply curve. Okay, Output stays stubbornly the same at 1,000. But if we're spending a hundred times more money on the same amount of goods, take this back to the quantity theory of money, what's going to happen to the price level. In my case, since I've just got generic units of output, it'll be the price, the average price of the good, it'll go up a hundredfold. Okay. What did we see? In other words, in the classical framework, the real business cycle framework, if we increase aggregate demand, does that help us at all? No, it just creates instantaneously and automatically massive inflation in the economy. Vice versa, if we, let me go back here, if we reduce aggregate demand, let's call this aggregate demand too, and let's say this is a hundred dollars of nominal spending. Again, reducing the spending, reducing the amount of total spending in the economy does nothing to our land labor capital technology, does nothing to impair our real resources, at least not in the classical framework. So all it will do is what? We're, we're still producing, we still have the capability to produce a thousand units of output but now we're only spending a hundred dollars. So uh, quick do that math in your head. What's a thousand, a hundred divided by a thousand, that would be 10 cents per unit. I uh, will see if aggregate demand declines and then we talk about shifting the aggregate demand curve down into the left. It's simply a deflation, simply a decline in prices across the economy. Okay. So, did the level of aggregate demand, it could be low down here, it could be high up here, it could be in the middle right here, did that impact the amount of output? No, the amount of output stays stubbornly fixed. It's based on what? Strictly the real factors of production, land, labor, capital, technology. Those are the only thing that matters in the real business cycle theory. Okay, It's easy to understand. Okay, The name is very literal. The framework is pretty simple. Okay, real business cycle theory, only real factors matter. Aggregate demand doesn't matter for output. It only matters for the inflation rate, which in a pure classical world is kind of the simplistic classical world. Even the inflation rate of the price level isn't going to be um, a relevant thing. Now, of course, in real economies, the inflation rate and the price level and those kind of things, those kind of nominal factors will be relevant things. So that's where we'll have to start thinking in more Keynesian terms, but we'll, but we'll do that later on. Okay, so with that in mind, we've got that framework in place, and if uh, you, you struggled with the framework, I would encourage you to go back and watch that portion of the video uh, again several times if necessary to really understand the intuition there, because we will be using that framework a lot from now on in the course. Okay, But let's move on for right now and talk about some real world, some actual examples and of different kinds of shocks, both positive and negative, that um, explain things we've actually seen happen in the world in a real business cycle framework. Okay, So I'll run quick, what I'll do first is run through a little table here that lists the factors of production and talks about what kind of shocks can happen to each factor and then we'll look at some historical examples to wrap this up. Okay, So land, and remember land, is, it really isn't the land itself, it includes land itself, but think in terms of kind of natural resources that come from the land, things that come from the earth. And what positive shocks can we see that improve the productivity of land? Well, the main thing is good weather. You have good weather, the land works uh, well to grow crops. Okay. And negative shock is bad weather. Drought, we've seen that uh, even in the U.S., although fortunately because our economy is so large, that doesn't really show up in, in the uh, GDP data. 
but in poorer, smaller, more primitive economies, it definitely will. Okay. We can also look at natural disasters, which can, uh, which can literally wipe away some of your land or make the land uh, a lot less productive in various ways. I'll show you an example here in a minute. Okay. Labor. What could go good with, with labor that could suddenly bring us more labor or more skilled labor? Well, think about um, a baby boom where we get a big increase in population. Okay. A lot of people think that's bad for the economy. Oh my goodness, overpopulation. Well, no, it's actually good for the economy. We have a lot more workers, especially if they're educated and trained. Uh, that adds to the labor component of our factors. Okay. Medical miracles would extend people's working lifespan. Okay, would do the same type of thing. What could go wrong there? Well, a mass death. Okay, something like plague that wipes out a big chunk of the population or an epidemic disease. War. Okay, war is not good for children and other living things. You may have heard. Very true. It's also not good for economic output. Okay, let's look at capital. What could go well with capital to increase our capital stock suddenly? Uh, we get an investment boom. Um, Investment boom, people suddenly investing more than they used to. Why would that happen? It's not just that people woke up one day and decided, oh, well, shoot, let's invest rather than consume. What usually happens is some kind of institutional reform where a country will see a change in its rules, a change in its structure, and things like property rights and things like the function of the legal system, which will kind of open the door to the latent potential of investment in that economy. This is what we saw in China. When China embraced the more private property oriented type of regime rather than the pure centrally planned communist regime. China has basically been seeing a, a decades long investment boom ever since then. Okay. Negative shocks that could destroy capital or that could reduce capital in an economy. Again, things like natural disaster and war. You'll find that those are recurring themes. Natural disaster and war, um, especially if they're big disasters or big wars and they hit a small economy, probably going to cause some real business cycle effects. Uh, natural disasters, smaller natural disasters that hit a big economy, um, they will definitely do damage. We don't, don't want to downplay the damage, uh, but they probably won't show up in the GDP numbers in a really big economy. Okay, finally, technology. We should be familiar with this. We're pretty used to this. We're pretty blessed with constant technological advances. Um, a big one that we'll look at here is the kind of the rise of the internet in the 1990s and that had big implications for business productivity. Um, what could go wrong with technology? Uh, fortunately, we're not, you know, we're not used to thinking about losing technology and maybe outside of sci-fi movies, but it has happened in human history. We you know, talk about the medieval, eight, the medieval era, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, where a lot of ancient wisdom, a lot of ancient learning was lost or just kind of was diminished. So it can't happen. Hopefully it won't happen in our lifetimes, but it definitely could happen. Okay. But let's look at some real historical examples now and we can kind of think think through how these things affect the economy. Okay. Let's look at some negative shocks. Uh, start off with the negative sh labor shock, which is Europe's Black Death, which happens in the mid-1300s. It wipes out about a third of, the, of Europe's population. We don't have really good GDP numbers for back then, but I'm going to go ahead and guess that it's about a third decline in real GDP as well. I'm going to guess it's proportional. Okay, so there's a massive real shock that clearly causes a massive decline in output, but does it cause unemployment? Actually, it actually improves the employment situation. I know this kind of sounds perverse, but think about it. The labor force shrinks dramatically, but the capital stock stays the same. Okay. If you survive the Black Death, now there's suddenly a lot more capital available. Okay. All the equipment, all the tools, all the buildings. Okay. The, the tools and buildings were pretty primitive back then, but they still had some capital. They had a little bit of capital. That stuff all, all survived the plague. Okay. So if you're a surviving worker, you have a lot more tools available. You are a lot more productive. Your marginal product of your labor increases, and suddenly you're earning a lot more money than you used to. 
Okay, and actually employment prospects go up after this. And a lot of historians will say this is the beginning of the end of feudalism and serfdom in Western Europe. Okay, serfdom, if you know anything about your um, European history, was that the peasants used to be tied to the land. They basically were a form of slave. Okay, they were totally bound to the land, totally dominated by the by the feudal uh, lords. And they didn't have the freedom. They couldn't leave. They couldn't go off to town. They couldn't make their own career plans, so on and so forth, things that we take for granted. Well, after the Black Death, the system started to fold because uh, land and capital was still around, but labor was in short supply. So how did the, the landlords, how did the feudal landowners um, and entrepreneurs get labor? They had to start offering them more attractive terms. Uh, like, hey, how about more pay? How about, what the heck, let's throw in your freedom if you come work for us, and this uh, led, led to the decline of feudalism. So, Actually, a positive result of an initial tragedy led to a positive result in the long run for our economic structure. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about another uh, example we can look at. Uh, drought, which would be a, a shock to the, to the land or to the natural resources. As I mentioned, it's only going to show up in GDP in a more primitive, more agricultural dominated economy. And uh, this chart is from the textbook, and I think it's referring to the Indian economy. This is some actual data. Um, okay, We got rainfall shocks, which is the blue. And basically, if the blue line's high, that means we're getting more rainfall than average. And if the blue line's low, we're getting less. Okay. Look right here. We've got minus 20% on our rainfall. And what happens to the output a farm output look it goes right along when rain falls down farm outputs down not surprising when rain falls up here's a positive here's a wet year and farm outputs up okay pretty tight relationship between rainfall and crop output and not surprisingly if crops is a big chunk of your GDP you're gonna see a positive relationship between rainfall and GDP okay here's the period of drought in the uh, late 1970s and look at it dragging GDP down and when the weather's good later on GDP comes back up right so it's not a perfect relationship but you notice it's a pretty there's a pretty high correlation there. there's a pretty tight relationship between rain and GDP real shocks okay this is a good application of real business cycle theory okay let me look at one last negative shock this one might be fresh in your memory you probably remember seeing these just very uh, disturbing, tragic images on the news a couple years back with the massive tsunami earthquake that hit Japan. Okay. This one did a lot of damage. Japan, we're talking about a, a large, highly industrialized, highly developed economy. Um, so it takes a big natural disaster to really show up in the GDP number. Unfortunately for Japan and the world, this was a very big, very tragic event. And look what it does. Now here's Japan's GDP growth. Okay. Japan is going to go into this big recession in 2009 with the rest of the world, but look how fast they climb right out of it. Their GDP growth is up to 5%. Okay. Japan had a really good recovery. But look, when the tsunami hits and the earthquake, which was in early 2011 here, drags them right back into recession here. Okay. And this, this negative growth here, it's something like minus 2%. That is associated. Now, the growth was tapering off here arguable whether that whether they would have gone into recession or not but this is clearly associated with the natural disaster okay, with that massive tsunami wiped out a lot of people it uh, caused the nuclear uh, meltdown which actually wiped out some land land became no longer inhabitable or useful for growing food and of course wiped out a lot of capital it destroyed buildings it destroyed vehicles it destroyed entire cities Okay, here's some pictures. I don't want to focus on this too much. It's kind of painful to look at, I know, but just look at the extent of the devastation. That's capital being destroyed. Of course, people were in there too. People got killed. That's destroying labor. Okay, that's just a massive and tragic negative real shock, and you can see it drag their GDP numbers down. Okay, let's, uh, let's wrap up with looking on the bright side. Let's look at some positive shocks. Um, this one probably you're familiar with as well. You know, the internet has come, kind of come on the scene in our lifetimes. It's actually been around for a long time, but it hasn't really been used for commercial uses 
really since the mid 1990s that's when it really came on the scene people started using email businesses started using websites businesses start using um, computer inventory management systems okay those are the things that have the real big productivity payoffs for business make them more efficient businesses get more efficient in a competitive economy go back to micro again what happens they cut prices for the consumers remember in competitive long-run equilibrium all surplus goes to consumers okay. so we're talking about real gains for consumers in terms of standard of living how much real output we can all buy with our incomes it goes way up okay because businesses are getting more efficient at producing goods and services okay so here's a classic example for the US economy uh, Alan Greenspan a former chairman of the Federal Reserve really focused on this as one of the driving factors of the good uh, growth rates that we saw in this time okay and here you can see he's talking about a once in a century acceleration of innovation and this is exactly what he's talking about he's talking about the internet boom okay. and you take a look here at this chart where we can see and I didn't write this in here but this is my 3.2 percent long-run growth rate trend for the US and here I'm only going back to 1990. I want to focus in on this period of the 90s. Okay, our long-run trend is 3.2. Here's our big recession in 09, something like minus 5%. Here's our anemic recovery since then, about 2%. Okay, this is our recent recovery. Here's our minus 5%. This is the great uh, recession of 09. But go back and look at the 90s right here, especially the late 90s. Look at these, look at these strong, these high growth rates, four, five percent growth. Look at that's well above our long-term trend of three point two percent. That is a boom, okay? That is a boom, and what's driving that boom? Well, according to a lot of economists, according to respected people like Alan Greenspan, that's being driven by this uh, pretty sudden onset of a new technology, okay? The internet and related things. So here is a real business cycle positive shock. Okay. So positive and negative shocks, very powerful forces that can explain these ups and downs that we observe in, um, in business cycle fluctuations. All right, but that's not all. That's not all. And the thing that we're going to have to look at next is that, well, what if we see a big fluctuation? What if we see a depression or a recession in the economy and we can't tie it down to particular negative shocks? Okay. Well, that's where we're going to have to look away from real factors and start looking at nominal factors. We're going to look away from supply side factors and start looking towards demand side factors. And that will bring us to the Keynesian business cycle theory. So stay tuned and we will uh, we'll move on and cover that next. Stronger. Yeah, that, that, that don't kill me. Can only make me stronger. I need you to hurry up now. Cause I can't wait much longer. I know I got to be right now. Cause I can't get much stronger. Man, I've been waiting all night now. That's how long I've been the